I wanted to thank you all so much for always responding down in the comment section to things that I've mentioned in my videos. It honestly helps me to plan future videos because I always want to make sure that I'm meeting your needs and giving you guys content that you want to see. So, so, so many of you guys told me you wanted me to film a video with sample interview answers and I feel you on a spiritual level with that one because I know when I first graduated college and I started interviewing for the first time, I wanted so badly someone just to outline answers for me. It's really difficult when you have never interviewed before or you haven't interviewed in a really long time and you just don't know what expectations the interviewers are going to have. You don't know what makes a good answer and you don't know how much you should include and you really just want something to go off of. I get it. I have totally been there and I still am there to a certain degree and I want you to know it is okay. I don't think there is such a thing as a perfect interview so please do not strive for that. Just make sure your interview answers reflect your personality and your teaching style. Have confidence that you are an amazing teacher and ultimately be yourself because that is the one thing that is really going to make you stand out among other candidates. I just want to make it clear that I am not an interview expert nor am I claiming to be one. However, I am very much an overachiever and an over planner and both of those things together have allowed me to gather a lot of information about interviews. In case you just stumbled across this video and you didn't watch my last one, I am going to do one more shameless plug because this honestly is something I worked really hard on and I do think that it's an extremely helpful tool when you're preparing for interviews. I have created an interview prep product and it is for sale in my Teachers Pay Teacher store. I will have the link for you down in the description box if you are interested and want to purchase it because you honestly think it is going to help you. In my last video which will be linked at the end of this video I do go through the product in its entirety and I show you all of the pages included so make sure you check that out if you want more information but basically my interview prep product that is really hard to say all together includes tips for interviews common interview questions it has checklists for phone video and in-person interviews and all kinds of different note pages that you can use to prepare for your next interview it is editable so you can completely customize it to fit your needs or you can type your information in instead of handwriting it if that's what you prefer in this video I decided to take 10 of what I feel are the most common interview questions for elementary teachers and give you guys sample answers to them the real the reason I say sample answers is because these are going to reflect my own personal teaching experiences. They really are just meant to spark your own ideas rather than being memorized word for word and then recited in an interview. Trust me, an interview panel can tell when you are not being authentic and I promise the best way to impress an interview panel is just by being yourself. In my interview prep product, I do have pages with all of those commonly asked interview questions with spaces underneath so you can write out sample answers and all of the questions I'm going to address in this video are included on that list. Question one, tell me a little about yourself. I know it sounds cliche, but I promise this interview question is asked all the time at the beginning of interviews as a way to break the ice. While it seems like a simple question, you want to make sure your answer really highlights yourself as an educator and you want to steer clear from any irrelevant information. Here's how I would answer that question. I received my bachelor's in elementary education and minor in mathematics from Salisbury University. I currently am pursuing my master's online in applied technology in education from Wilmington University. I previously taught second grade for three years at a Title I school in Wicomico County. I previously completed professional development courses on smart technology and Microsoft Office because I believe that integrating technology in education is vital, especially considering how important it is in today's society and the fact that it's always changing. I also love traveling and I've traveled to over 10 different countries because I love being able to bring those rich experiences back into my classroom to build the background knowledge of my students. Question two, describe your personal philosophy of education. Now, I wouldn't say that this gets asked at every interview. However, you do want to have an answer prepared because this question can really reveal whether or not you would be a good fit for the position. I personally include a statement about my philosophy of education directly on my resume, and that is one reason I recommend having your resume in front of you during interviews. This is the type of question where if you don't have an answer prepared, you can end up going in circles without really saying anything. Here's how I would answer that question. I personally believe a philosophy of education has three parts, your philosophy of teachers, your philosophy of students, and your philosophy of learning. I believe teachers should establish a positive and productive learning environment and should expect great things from all of their students. Teachers should engage with students personally as well as academically to help build relationships. Every student is an individual and learns in a different way and it's a teacher's job to meet their needs and make sure they have the tools they need to be successful. Finally, I believe learning 
learning is a lifelong process and I want my students to be as passionate about learning as I am. Question three, tell me how you plan a lesson from start to finish. This seems like an obvious question that would be simple to answer, but at the same time, it's so broad, it can actually be really difficult to answer without a specific subject or topic. Here's how I would answer that question. Whenever I'm planning a lesson, I start by reading the standard and determining what goal I have for my students at the end of the lesson. Then I will set the learning objective and target for my students and figure out how I'm going to assess their level of proficiency. When I actually start planning the lesson, I first look at where my students already are in comparison to the standard, and I think about the best way to present the information, whether it's direct instruction, small group instruction, cooperative learning, or some other strategy. Next, I think about how I can differentiate the activity or the assessment to meet all of my students' needs and make sure everyone is successful. One of the last things I do, and personally my favorite, is figure out how to make the lesson more engaging, whether it's by integrating technology, integrating art, or integrating different subject areas to make sure that my students are active learners for the duration of the lesson. Question four, how do you use assessment to drive your instruction? Data and assessment are almost guaranteed to be asked about because in today's world of education, those are huge. It's really important to highlight different forms of assessment, but you also wanna make sure you address how you will use the data in your planning of future lessons. Here's how I would answer that question. I often utilize pre-assessments at the opening of a new unit to determine my students' prior knowledge and figure out which students might need intervention or enrichment. For math, I use something called clipboard cruising, which is basically a spreadsheet that I keep with all of my students' names and all of the standards for every lesson, and I can easily mark student performance when I'm working with them in a small group or observe them working independently. Then I use that information along with exit tickets that I give periodically to help determine which students need intervention on a particular standard or concept. For ELA, I use running records throughout the year to monitor student growth and adjust my guided reading groups accordingly. After giving summative assessments such as unit tests or county interim assessments, I make sure that I analyze all of the data. That way I can determine my students' levels of proficiency for the standards assessed and use that information to guide my future lessons. I also keep a one-page data summary sheet for each student that has all of their term grades and all of their assessment scores so that I can see trends over time and I also have all of my information easily accessible for meetings and conferences. Question five, tell me about your classroom management style. You are almost guaranteed to get a question about classroom or behavior management and you wanna make sure your answer portrays a clear message to show that your classroom management plan is well thought out. Here's how I would answer that question. The most essential part of my classroom management style is building a classroom community beginning on the first day of school. I believe that building strong relationships with my students along with keeping them challenged and engaged are the keys to eliminating most misbehaviors. I communicate high expectations with my students and I consistently hold them to those high expectations. The school I previously taught at utilized PBIS so I used a combination of class dojo and a clip chart to promote positive behaviors. By moving up on the clip chart my students earned class dojo points that they could redeem for a variety of rewards such as having lunch bunch with the teacher. When students moved down on the clip chart and ended the day below ready to learn, they would fill out a reflection sheet so they were able to think about their choices and they worked with the teacher to develop a plan of how to handle the situation differently in the future. While giving consequences for bad choices can be necessary, I personally think it's more important to teach students how to rethink their choices and give them the tools they need so they can make better choices in the future. Question six. How do you communicate with parents and guardians? Again, some kind of question about parents and communication is bound to come up during your interview. I personally recommend stressing that you build positive relationships with the parents and you want to work with them as a team to make sure their child is successful. Here's how I would answer that question. I always make sure I contact all of my parents within the first week of school and reach out to them to start to build a positive relationship. I use Class Dojo to communicate with parents and I also post about things happening in the classroom, that way parents can be active participants in their child's education, even with hectic work schedules. I send out weekly classroom newsletters, both physically and digitally through email and class dojo. That way all of the parents are updated on what's happening in the classroom, even if they don't have access to class dojo. I encourage parent involvement through events like muffins with mom and donuts with dad. And I also have my students complete formal writing pieces once per month, and their parents are always invited in for the presentations. Most importantly, I want parents to know that I want to work with them as a 
team to help make sure their student is successful. Question seven, how do you adapt your instruction to meet the needs of diverse learners? I always hate this question because it is so broad and so many different things can be meant by diverse learners. It could be ELL students, it could be students with disabilities, or it could be students with different ethnicities. It is completely okay to ask for clarification on a question if you're not really sure what the interviewer is asking. Here is how I would answer that question. Primarily, I create a safe classroom environment where all of my students feel free of judgment from peers and adults. I use a lot of cooperative learning and that's one of the reasons I actually use tables instead of desks. I want my students to have opportunities to use language in meaningful ways and develop academic communication and social skills. I make sure I learn about cultural norms and family history that influence a student's learning and behavior and I make sure that I build a positive relationship with all of my students by attending sporting events and other activities outside of school whenever possible. Throughout the year I utilize text with perspectives of different ethnic groups and I make sure that all of my students feel represented in the books available in my classroom library. Question 8. Tell me about a lesson that went really well. How do you know you were successful? The key part to this question is that second part. How do you know you were successful or what made the lesson a good lesson? This is really an opportunity for you to highlight the necessities of a good lesson, such as student engagement or student growth. Here's how I would answer that question. This past year, I taught a science lesson focused on the states of matter involving hands-on activities with crayons. I started by showing my students a mystery bag and then I presented the essential question. We read a book and discussed how the crayons were changed in the book. We then watched a video about how crayons were made and my students went back to their seats, broke up the pieces of crayon and melted them. Then my students wrote postcards from the crayon's perspective to describe how they were changed just like in the book and we ended by going back to that essential question and checking for understanding. I know the lesson was successful because my students were highly engaged the entire time and they demonstrated a better understanding of the states of matter at the conclusion of the lesson. I think what made this lesson a good lesson is the fact that I had all of the materials prepared and I had directions displayed on a PowerPoint and that allowed the lesson to flow really well well and we used every second of valuable time. The lesson was also relevant to my students and it incorporated different subject areas so student learning happened effortlessly. Question 9. Tell me about a lesson that didn't go well. What did you learn from it? This question is common in interviews because the interviewer wants to see how you adapt your instruction to grow as an educator or how you use feedback to improve. You want to make sure your answer highlights how you are able to adapt and grow rather than any deficits you may have as a teacher. Here's how I would answer that question. Question. During my first year of teaching, I remember a lesson where my students and I were reading a story called Jamaica Louise James. In the story, the girl rides on a subway and my students were so lost because they didn't have background knowledge on subways since most of them have never left our town. That lesson demonstrated for me the necessity of building background knowledge and vocabulary for my students so they can have a better understanding. After this lesson, I actually developed my own vocabulary templates where it displays the word with a definition, the word used in a sentence, synonyms, antonyms, and a picture or video to help build that background knowledge of my students. Since using these templates in the years after that lesson, I have noticed a huge increase in my students' vocabulary and background knowledge that have really allowed them to grow more as readers. Question 10, do you have any questions for us? This will almost always get asked at the end of an interview and it's kind of a trick question because you have to have questions prepared to ask. You wanna appear eager and passionate about this position and one way to do that is by asking questions at the end. I know personally, if I waited until the end of the interview to come up with questions, chances are my mind would go blank and I would end up saying that I don't have any questions right now. That's why I recommend having a few questions prepared, even written down in your notes or on a pad of paper so you don't forget. These are a few questions I typically ask at the end of an interview. What are you most proud of about your school or district? What is the biggest challenge facing your school or district? How active are parents on average within your school or district? If you are a first year teacher, you might want to ask if they have a new teacher mentoring program or what professional development opportunities are available. Then I always end by asking asking when I can expect to hear back or what the next step is in the interview process. I hope that hearing how I would answer these questions has helped give you some ideas for preparing for your own interviews. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and feel free to share it with any of your teacher friends who might also like it. My next video will be my vlog from this week and it will include parts of my phone interview, so make sure you are subscribed to me so you don't miss it. As always, thank you for watching. I love you.
you all so much and I'll catch you in the next one. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end and for supporting my YouTube channel. If you want to check out any of my older videos, you can use the two links right down here. If you want to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any future videos, you can use the link right up here. The links to all of my social media sites, my Teachers Pay Teacher store and my Amazon store are down in the description box for you and I will catch you guys in the next one.